Here we get to a bit about Rachel having claustrophobia, something that has never been established before, and like the spider and the bananas, comes off as a distraction from the story as opposed to complementing it. The Animorphs end up taking turns morphing Mole and digging out a tunnel, but it's slow going. They can only dig about six to seven feet a day. Oh man, Tobias moaned. If we're right and we have to dig down 50 feet, that would take us a week. You've got to be kidding me. I'm a bird. I have no business being in a tunnel. Ah, great. And now Tobias is on one of his hawk superiority rants. Just perfect. Will the Animorphs dig on like troopers until four days later when they hit solid rock? Frustrated, Rachel morphs Mole again and tries to find a break through it, which she does, and ends up breaking through the wall into a cave. The Animorphs all enter the cave to discover it's full of bats. Not sure what to do, the Animorphs decide to morph Bat and attempt to find a way out of the cave, and then reassess their situation. The only one without a Bat morph is Tobias, so while he acquires one, the rest of the Animorphs chat about just how crazy the whole situation is. Battles that involve oatmeal are just never going to end up being historic, you know? Jake went on. Gettysburg? No major oatmeal involvement. The Battle of Midway? Neither side used oatmeal. Desert Storm? No oatmeal. Excuse me, but what is oatmeal? Axe said. Okay, so it's been a week since Edelman told them about the Yerk's weakness to oatmeal. They've been spending the last five days digging a hole to the Yerk pool to use the oatmeal against them. And Axe is only now asking what oatmeal is! That's like if I was teamed up with a bunch of soldiers. They came up with a plan to take a tricky sniper rifle shot against the enemy. I assist them in five days of planning and setting it up. And then a few hours before the plan goes down, I ask, Hey! What is a sniper rifle, anyway? The Animorphs morph bat and start flying towards an exit, only to discover that it leads into the Yerk Pool. Well, okay, they made it. But before they can get a moment to take it all in, two flying orbs approach them. Hunter robots, Axe yelled. We should leave. Why, I asked. Because they're called Hunter robots! So yeah, the orbs start shooting at them, and the Animorphs scatter, but the orbs are too quick. Thankfully, they manage to disable one of them by hitting its robot eye with a rock, which seems a bit too easy, but then the Yerk's bug fighters explode by getting gently pushed by a slow-moving bulldozer, so it's no surprise they also made their security robots out of fine china and stunt glass. And just why are these things here? The only reason they exist is to shoot bats, so if the bat cave is a problem, why don't they dig it out, or at least seal up the entrance? Why waste time shooting every single bat that wanders in? Well, anyway, Rachel gets shot in the wing, and she falls down into the pool. Thankfully, Yerks are blind, and none of the controllers around the pool notice a bat swimming around. Rachel manages to make her way under one of the docks surrounding the pool, demorphs, and then morphs into an ant, managing to crawl up the clothes of a human controller. She rides around for a while, then falls off and demorphs again finding herself in a weapon storage room with a bunch of Dracon beams stored in boxes that open with a simple push of a button. So, biofilters around the doors, robots designed to shoot bats, but their gun cases are easier to get into than a bottle of Tylenol. The Yerks really seem to fluctuate between super high security and no security at all. Case in point, Rachel takes a Dracon beam and stuns a woman controller, stealing some of her clothes and hiding in the crowd. Now the Animorphs have snuck into the Yerk Pool twice before, not to mention half a dozen other Yerk facilities. You would think that, at some point, the Yerks would invest in a few security cameras. I could just imagine them going over the tapes thinking, Hey, that girl with the oversized clothes! She's not a controller! Yeah, so Rachel wanders around for a bit, and discovers that Jake, Tobias, and Axe have been captured, and that Visor 3 will be coming down to deal with the matter personally. Rachel then discovers that the Yerks are more than aware of the whole oatmeal issue. A controller is caught smuggling in a case of the stuff, and Rachel discovers the shed where the Yerks keep all the confiscated oatmeal. After almost getting captured, Rachel runs into Cassie and Marco just as Visor 3 arrives. They hide in the back of a cafeteria, which just happens to be right in front of the shed with the oatmeal. Rachel morphs Elephant and breaks through the wall, through the shed, and successfully tosses a sealed barrel of oatmeal into the pool. This leads to a Mexican standoff, with Marco pointing the Dracon beam at the barrel, Rachel demanding Visitor 3 let the rest of them go, or they blow the barrel. 
However, what they don't count on was Visor 3 being a ruthless asshole that people only follow because a sword grows out of his butt. And Visor 3 writes off the thousand or so Yerks in the pool and tells his soldiers to attack. Thinking fast, Rachel wraps her trunk around Visor 3 and manages to toss him into the pool. Fortunately, I know just a little about Andalite physiology. See, they eat and drink through their hooves. Right now, the Visor was absorbing the water of the Yerk pool. I glared with my one remaining eye at the Visor, floundering in the pool. Now do you care if we blow up that barrel? I asked him. Now do you care? It turned out, yes. Yes, he cared. Visor 3 would sacrifice hundreds of his fellow Yerks to the oatmeal madness. After all, it was war. But, and sacrifices had to be made sometimes. But those sacrifices obviously did not include him. <laughs> okay, so that just opens up more questions than it answers. Andalite hooves are eating all the time? They can't stop them? Has Visor 3 been eating the dirt floor this entire time? Do Andalites leave little indents wherever they stand? Do Andalites have to keep moving because if they'll start sinking into the ground if they stand in one spot too long? And if they can't stop eating, why aren't Andalites fat? So yeah, the rest of the Animorphs are freed and they try to make their exit. But Visor 1 quickly morphs a pterodactyl-like alien, and the Animorphs find themselves caught on some stairs between the Visor and some hork measure. Marco fires and the barrel explodes, which causes some chaos, but the Animorphs are still trapped. Oh, and uh, Rachel and Jake and I think Marco all demorph into human. And nobody notices! This is even worse than the sneaking into the mental hospital thing. I have no idea how the now human Animorphs aren't in direct sight of both Visor 3 ascending the stairs and the Hork Measure descending the stairs. And that's when it hit me. Give me the Dracon Beam! It's not gonna stop that... That thing? It's armored all over. Nothing will stop that thing. How do you know that, Marco? Are you studied in alien physiology? An armadillo is armored all over, but I'm pretty sure it will be a little upset after getting shot by a vaporizing gun! But no, instead of shooting the two hork measure ahead of them and making a path for escape, Rachel instead aims the gun at the ceiling and causes the tunnel to collapse on them. I guess dirt decided to be marshmallow fluff today, because the Animorphs are not killed by the tons of earth falling on them, and are able to morph mole and dig their way straight up to the Bat Cave in about four hours, even though I'm pretty sure it's a longer dig up to the cave than down to it. All the Animorphs make it to the cave, and they morph Bat again and fly back into the city. The book ends with the readers learning that Rachel decided to break Edelman out of the mental institution so that he can wander around half insane with no job, no money, no loved ones willing to care for him, and he'll probably get killed by the Yerks first chance they get. Good job, Rachel! Postbook follow-up. Yeesh. I don't remember this book being this confusing and unengaging the first time I read it. So many things don't make any sense my head spins. Story elements are raised and dropped at a moment's notice. The action is poorly written. I noticed more technical errors this time around, like quotation marks being used when a character is using thought speak a few times. It's, it's just a mess. What's sad is the concept itself is sound. Despite how intentionally goofy the Yerk's big weakness being oatmeal is, it does offer a genuine moral dilemma for the Animorphs. It's also interesting because this is the second book in a row where we learn of an alternative way for Yerks to survive without Gondrona rays, both of which are extremely harmful and morally suspect. It really drives home just how much of a crutch Gondrona rays are to the Yerks. And you know, I might be more forgiving of this book if it meant more to the overall storyline than it ultimately does. A barrel of mutation-causing oatmeal exploded in the Yerk pool, but so little is going to come of that. Compared to when the Animorphs destroyed the Kondrona ten books ago, that had immediate, wide impact on the conflict and was a key event that affected the entire story. The oatmeal in the Yerk Pool had the potential to be just as earth-shaking as that, but it's not, and I don't know why. This book has no serious character moments to speak of, the plotting is weak, and it doesn't go in the direction it should have been concerning the moral conflict and its ultimate impact on the Yerk conflict. It's 
gets a little saving grace for expanding on the Yerk security effort and a chuckle here and there, but in the end, I give Animorphs number 17 The Underground a 4 out of 10. I love an oatmeal box. Give me an oatmeal box. Because an oatmeal box makes pretty music. Kick a boom! Just take an oatmeal box. You'll love an oatmeal box. Because an oatmeal box makes pretty music. Chicka boom, chicka boom, 